good morning and welcome to Rock Harbor. Good to see every one of you here today. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm one of the guys on staff, and it's my privilege to share today as we continue on uh, in our series, Truth Wars, where we've been talking about uh, how do we cultivate a biblical world view? In the world that we live today, how do we make sure that, that we are, our view of, of what life is is coming from Scripture and not from ourself? And for some of us, uh, this can be a very difficult thing, and we wanna make sure that we have the correct view, because it's easy to miss it if you don't have all the context and understanding of what God's word has to say. Uh, it reminds me of a story about 11 years ago. Um, we were living in New Mexico at the time. Uh, when I think about New Mexico, I think it's not really new. It's not really Mexico, um, but it is a state uh, that we have here in the United States. And we decided to go bowling one afternoon with our kids. Uh, Cam was about 12, 13. Carly was about 10, 11 years old, and, and they wanted to bring a friend. So Cam brought Nakai with him, and, uh, and then our daughter brought McKenna with her. And we're bowling a couple of frames, having a good time. And you know how middle schoolers are. They kind of just would run off a little bit in between their bowling time, and they would come back. And we discovered they were playing some video games uh, in between the time when it was their turn to bowl. And uh, they would come back a little bit late. It was a little frustrating, I'll be honest. And uh, then they would come back, they'd bowl, and I said, hey guys, why don't you just stay here? They're like, hey, Deb, we wanna go one more time. I said, okay, great. You guys go ahead and then come back and then we're gonna finish up and then we're gonna head home. And so they will go over to this game, they went to that claw game. You know where the claw comes out and then you put money in it and it goes all the way down and then the levers grab something but nothing comes up with it? You know that game? It's just a way to take more things, more money from the parents, right? That's all that is. And uh, so that's the game they were playing. They hadn't won anything all day. And they came back and they were like giggling, like just little, like little girl, like they were just giggling. And I'm like, what is going on? They're like, nothing, nothing, nothing. I said, guys, what's going on? They're like, nothing, nothing, nothing. And you know as a parent, <laughs> the times your children say nothing, nothing, nothing is the time that you really need to figure out what's going on. Sometimes you wanna know, sometimes you don't wanna know. And I remember standing there going, hey, Kim, we're not leaving until you tell us what happened. And he goes, all right, Nikai, you, you won it. And I go, won what? And Nikai goes, well, I, I won, I won these <laughs> in the claw machine. And I said, you won what? He said, I, I won these in the claw machine. And I'm like, hey, Nikai, we're not those kind of people. Like, that's just, that's weird, man. And so now I have to take you back to your house um, I said, I'm gonna go up to the door with you and talk to your parents. We were good friends with his parents. So he was Cam's basketball coach and we knew them very, very well. And I just walked up, I said, hey Danny, I'm just gonna let you know. Like, Nikai used your money to buy something he shouldn't have and now they're your property and they're yours, right? And, and I thought it was over. I thought, that's it, it's over. That's, that's all that's gonna take place. Until about two weeks ago, two weeks went by and um, we received a text message, my wife and I did, from Priscilla, uh, Nikai's mom and, and Danny was in there as well, his dad. And she said, hey, I just wanted to share with you uh, something, a phone call that I received today. I said, oh, really? Okay, great. And this is what the phone call was about. She said, my phone rang, ring, ring. She said, hello. She said, hi, Mrs. Smith. I'm the principal at Enchanted Hills Elementary School. I don't want to embarrass you by calling, but I figured it would be better to call um, than to send a note home. She said, oh, okay. She said, I actually got a kick out of this. Your daughter, Deja, who was eight at the time, beautiful little girl, she was caught with a pair of red fluffy handcuffs <laughs> at school today. And, and Priscilla goes, oh, okay, um, um, those are my sons. <laughs> and then she said, wait, no, my son won those at a claw game at the, at the, at the, at the you know, he was with like the pastor and the pastor helped him get like, <laughs> she didn't throw me under the bus, she might have, I don't know, she didn't say if she did or not. And, she goes, uh, okay, and he goes, well, I'll tell you what, if you would like to come home and you would like to bring those home, you just swing by the, the school anytime and they'll be in my top desk drawer that you and your husband, you can come pick those up anytime you would like. <laughs> now, the principal thought that he had the full context and his perspective was one thing, right? Only to find out that really something completely different had actually taken place. And I think there are times that we do the same exact thing when it comes to having a biblical world view. We all know pieces, we know parts of the Bible, but there are some times that we're influenced more by culture and society than we are by the word of God. It's why it's so important for us, and that's why we're doing this whole series, Truth Wars, is to, to help us all understand, like, how do I cultivate a biblical world 
view? How can I make sure that I'm living the life that I am supposed to live? Over the past few weeks, we've covered some, some very difficult topics. We talked about politics and we talked about scripture and how those two things, often when they collide, there's a lot of drama that can take place. And we love Josh McPherson's quote, where he says that, that the church is not becoming more political, but politics are becoming more theological today. And as a church, like we have to say, are we gonna take a stand on God's word or are we not going to address difficult things today? Like even that word politics, like we break it down and we realize that poly means many, right? And ticks are like blood-sucking creatures. <laughs> many blood-sucking creatures. So glad you came to church today. And we laugh about that, right? But, but we're going, man, in our world today, there's a lot of drama and things that take place. So we talked about that. We talked about human dignity. We've talked about the sanctity of life and how we can protect life. We talked about sin and how sin entered in the world and it changed everything. We talked about gender and sexuality. We've talked about God's design for the family. And we've talked about world religions. And then today we're gonna kind of flip a little bit. We're gonna talk about from Genesis, this whole idea of what is our belief on work and our belief on rest? Because these two things, we believe that they affect everything else that we have talked about. Having a healthy understanding and the right perspective from God's word on what he says about work and what he says about rest will inform how we are to live today. And for many of us, this can be a very difficult subject because man, it can be very, very tense because we all have different relationships. We all have different experiences with work and with rest. And so in your Bibles today, in Genesis chapter two, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how God created everything and what everything began to look like and then how it all shifted just through one simple decision that Eve made. Genesis chapter two and verses two through three says this. It says, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now we think about the Genesis story, the account of God making everything. He made the sun, he made the stars, he made the moon, he made the earth, he made Adam, he made Eve, he made all the animals, he made the Garden of Eden, and every day when he was done creating, the Bible says that God looked at it all and he said, it is good. It's good. The creator looked at all of his creation and he said, this is good, it is right. But for many of us, we, we don't understand like, well, how do we get to where we are today? Because this is like a, a, an artist creating this masterpiece where you just step back and you go, look at what the Lord has created. I mean, here you have Adam and Eve and they're in the garden and it's perfect. It's exactly the way that God designed it to be. And he worked for six days. And then on the seventh, he rested. And here's what we discover. God has built you for work and he's also built you for rest. He's built you for both. And then he, 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 he set the precedent for us by working for six and then taking a day off and then resting. You see, for many of us, rest is a, a difficult thing. Like we don't know how to rest. We don't know what we should do with that. And I don't believe God was exhausted. I don't believe that he was tired. I don't believe that he couldn't have kept going. I believe that he wanted to show you and I the relationship that we should have with work and rest. Yes, we should be willing and ready to work hard, but we should also put as much emphasis in to rest because in the rest is when we actually connect with our Savior. In the rest is where we actually trust him to take care of the work that we have done and trust that it's all his anyway. And if we're not careful, we can make, our, make it about us. Have you ever completed a project and you step back and you go, this is good. When I step back from a project, I normally go, that is okay. 
Like, I don't know how that got together, but it did. And, and it worked out, and I don't have all the abilities that some people have to make things look good. But like when God looked down, he's like, this is good. I remember moving into this facility uh, just about four years ago in a couple of weeks. And it was during the middle of COVID, and we walked in and to watch people walk in and be like, man, this is an amazing building that we get to worship in, and we get to sing in, and we get to learn about God's principles from. Because for nine years, we had met in a high school, and it was a nice high school, but it wasn't this. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, it kinda, you're, you're kinda cleaning out the lockers and cleaning out different things to make it look good for church on Sunday because it didn't smell quite right in certain places there. Like, now we can actually control some of those things. We, we could control what some of those things are. We, we couldn't do that before. But I remember walking in here and being like, man, seeing the seats filled, knowing that they had been prayed over, knowing that, that God was gonna do a work and a move in people's lives and hearts like we had never seen before. And now we look at it, we're just like blown away by what God has done in just a few short years. And it's easy to look back at that and go, man, look at all the things that you have done. You see, for work, for us, it's meant to be meaningful. It's meant to give us purpose in this life. And, and we realize that our work is not for us, but our work truly is for the Lord. But also it's this idea of rest that God modeled for us, reminding us that life isn't about endless productivity. Sometimes we need to breathe in and like take in all that God is doing, which helps us understand the second part of this whole idea of work and rest. We understand that man, mankind, it broke work and it broke rest. In Genesis chapter three and verse 17, the Bible says, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you, you shall not eat of it, Cursed is the ground because of you. For in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. But the sweat of your face or your brow shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You see, when we look, apply this to our life, we realize that because sin entered into the world, it changed work for you and me. Now, this is the whole idea that, that God was setting out for us is that work and rest are as important, but, but when we understand about having a biblical worldview today, it's understanding like, why do we work the way that we do? Because we understand that, that back then that when God created everything, everything was perfect. And Adam and Eve, they were just to oversee the garden. That's all they were supposed to do, like just be there and to be in paradise. But because sin entered into the world, the Bible says that you will have the sweat from your brow and you will end up toiling in the soil. And it's going to be hard to grow things up from it because of sin entering into the world. And that's how sin works, right? Like you think about Adam and Eve in the garden. They, you can do anything you wanna do in the garden. You can eat of anything except for this one tree. You, can, you have dominion over the animals, you have dominion over the land, everything is fruitful, everything is multiplying. You can do anything you want except for this one tree. Just don't touch or eat from it. And this is how Satan works today with sin. You see, the first thing that, that we see is, is that there's a temptation that comes in front of us. Eve was tempted. The snake, the serpent came and started talking to her, which should have been your first clue. Like, snakes start talking, deuces, I'm out. Like, no thanks. Starts talking to her and telling her it's okay. And she begins to become tempted with actually sinning and doing something that she shouldn't do. And then what she do? She goes and she involves Adam in this. So there's some temptation. Well, now there's a hesitation to just kind of check out what's going on and should we do this or should we not? And it went from temptation to hesitation to participation. Temptation, hesitation, participation. The model that Satan has used for sin from day one hasn't changed. The same is true for you and I today. Temptation comes our way. We have to decide, am I going to stand back from that and say, get thee behind me, Satan, or am I going to listen to things that I shouldn't listen to? And just by listening may be enough of a hesitation that we end up participating in that sin at some point and at some time. And that's what happened for Adam and Eve. They, they began to participate in this and when they participated, everything shifted. 
Our, our worldview shifts because it's like, now I understand why work is so hard, why it's so difficult at, at times. And it continues to change through the generations. I mean, we think about the baby boomer, boomers. Like those who were baby boomers, they, they were hard working individuals. I was reading about it a couple of weeks ago and they said that most baby boomers in their prime working years, they were working 50 to 60 hours a week. That was just a standard. That was just normal for them. They just worked and they worked and they were loyal to their company. In their prime working years, that, that they, they would typically stay at a, in a career or actually at a place for eight years and three months. And then we get to the next generation, Gen Xers, the generation that actually had to raise themselves because their parents were working all the time. Our parents had no idea where we were at. It was amazing. They didn't know what we were doing. No Life 360, no Find My iPhone. It was a great time to grow up. It was a good time to grow up. Nobody knew where we were at. You would just show up at home when you were supposed to and everything was supposed to be fine. But Gen Xers, they, they wanted to have a little bit different work-life balance. They worked eight hours a day, but, but they actually, they would value work and they would also value time with family and find rest in that. And what we discover is, is that typically from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, it's like the previous generation is just making fun of and saying how soft the next generation is and how they don't wanna work hard. And is there any truth in that? I am not going to answer that today publicly. We know this is a struggle for us because Gen X, it leads to the millennials. The millennials, uh, they, they actually stay only two years and nine months at a job typically. They, they transfer out because they're looking for more flexibility in their work. They work just as hard, I believe that. But, but they want more flexibility in, in their work. And so it's, it's completely shifted today. Like it went from, hey, I am a loyal company person here for all of my life to, I might be there for a couple years and I'm gonna find something different to do because there might be another opportunity that I can have more flexibility or make more money or whatever the case is. It's this whole idea of work, it just, we, we wanna work, we wanna work the way that we desire to work. And we can feel drained or frustrated by our work. And we have to remember this is often just a reminder of the broken world in which you and I live in today and that we all need God's grace. You see, we all are called to work hard. Whether we work in a career, whether we're a stay-at-home mom and we work as a mom at home, like the value in that is so high and so great that moms, they need a break as well. Like, like when we come home, dad's like, that's an opportunity. And I know that everybody has different work situations. Some, some work outside the home, some work inside the home. The value is the same. You have to figure out what's right for you as a family and every family is different. But when we encounter work today, know that it's not going to be easy. He says in verse two of Genesis that, hey, thistles and thorns are gonna spring up. The soil is gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to actually produce something from. And so this work that we're doing, we're toiling and it gets frustrating after a while. But God, he's placed all of us here for his purpose and to make a difference, not just in our own lives, but also in the lives of others. And the third thing that we discover today is that God blesses us through work and he blesses us through rest. Some of you are going, my work is not a blessing to me, Scott. Nice try. For some of you, it's not. For some of you, it, it, it is a blessing. You, you enjoy it. Verse three says, and then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Why? Because he rested from all the work of creating and all that he had done. Don't raise your hand. But do you ever feel guilty when you rest? You ever feel guilty for just sitting back and, and resting and needing a, a break? You see, God's command for rest is not a suggestion. You know what it is? It's an invitation to trust him. It's an invitation to say that you working five, six days a week, you'll accomplish more than working every single day of your life because we all need a break. But Sabbath, True Sabbath is countercultural to our world today. We live in a world that says just keep pressing forward, keep moving on, don't take a break, just keep going. But work, work is not where we find our value. We find our value in the Lord. And what rest is, true Sabbath, it's the opportunity to reconnect with our Savior. It's to say, you know what, I have so much going on, I need to catch 
my breath. I, I need to take a break. And after the Lord worked for six days creating, he says, then I made it holy, I said it's holy, and he rested. You see, if God takes a day off, maybe we should follow that model as well and take a day off. I mean, all the work that he had done, could he have kept going? Of course he could have kept going. But he kept going and said, you know what, I'm gonna take a break because there's value in this today. The Bible says that he made it holy and he made it set apart. He wants us to find our rest in him. You see, God uniquely designed our world and knows what's best for us. And when we fight against it, we're actually fighting against God. And we can get going so fast and have so many different things going on that, that we don't actually take the breaks that we desperately need to. You say, well, if God worked for six days and then he rested on the seventh, why do we have two-day weekends? I'm so glad you asked. Because we did what we are all so good at doing. The Jewish Sabbath was Saturday. The Christian Sabbath is Sunday. And so we took them both. We said, you know what? I don't wanna work six days a week. I'll work five days a week. And we set out what our work schedule is like here in the world today. And as you look at this text and you begin to, to dig into it even more, you, you realize what, it, what he's actually saying is, is that, that in six days, God breathed out. And he created. And on the seventh day, God breathed in. And he took everything in that he had created. And he found rest in his Father. And the same is true for you and I today. God didn't design you to be a workaholic. God didn't design you not to find rest in him. God designed you for relationship with him. And this is the truth that we all need to hear today. It's very simple. Some of you are here today and you need to learn to work. You're like, I'm so glad I'm here. You need to learn to work. Some people don't know how to put their hand to the plow and actually get work done. I used to work for a, a pastor and he used to say this all the time. He said, you know, if you wanna get ahead in life, all you have to do is work because you have so little competition. Nobody wants to work today. They don't want to work hard. Now there's a lot of hardworking people here, I, I know that. But there are some, like you need to get up and you need to get going and you need to work. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward, for you are serving the Lord Christ. You see, work is good for us. It gives us purpose. It gives us meaning. It gives us an idea of how do I fulfill God's purpose in my life? You see, you realize that the reason that you and I are here today, it's, it's to do work for him. You say, well, I don't work at a church, Scott. It doesn't matter if you work at a church, if you work at Target, if you work at Walmart, if you work at Simply, it doesn't matter where you work. The Bible says we are to work heartily and unto the Lord. Because it's like as believers, we get to go to all these different places and we get to show the model of what Jesus said that we're supposed to do, that we should work hard. There are some of you here that you need to learn to rest. There are some of you in this room that are workaholics. You rest very few times. For some of us, we're, we're workaholics because we, we just like we need to produce and make sure that we provide our family the life that we want to give them. And we don't actually trust the Lord that he can actually do that. And so we just work and we work and we work and we turn into a workaholic. For some, it's an escape from reality. For some, it's an escape from your family. For some, it's just an escape from, I just wanna go do my own thing and not be bothered. And sometimes, sometimes this is it's gonna create tension in your marriage. Like you're just working too much. You know, as a family, it's easy to become like just passing ships in the night. And we're no longer soulmates, but we're roommates because you're running the kids over here and you're running the kids over here and we have very little time for one another because we have so much going on. I remember the season that we were in when Cam was playing basketball and it's not like a three month season, right? That's like year round, it's just what you do. 
Harley was in cheer, and cheer is like a year-round thing, and you go on all these trips, and it's amazing, and it's, oh, it's just wonderful. I don't miss it. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. They keep saying, you're gonna miss it. I'm like, still waiting. <laughs> I enjoyed the season, but we were so busy. It was like we were more disconnected as a family than ever before. We were just trying to like get through some of those seasons. Some of you were stay-at-home moms, and you're like, man, I, I need a break from just the day because your work in the home it is so great, and, and the weight like of caring for families, there's a reason some of us don't do that. Like It wouldn't be healthy for the kids. It wouldn't be healthy for us, but it's a gift when you can do that. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you get to that point where you're burnt out, you're tired, you don't know what to do, like you can find your rest in the Lord. And this is gonna be a, a constant tension that you're having to manage probably all the days of your life. Like how do I manage this tension of work? How do I manage this tension of rest? How, how do I press into that? And here's what all of us need to hear about today. All of us need to learn to find our rest in Jesus. That's where true rest comes from. It comes from the Lord. It comes from reading his word. That's us like, like inhaling and taking the Lord in. And as we take the Lord in, it's going to change and impact our mind and how we live this life. Like Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then in verse two, he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our minds today? It's by sitting down and taking some time, some Sabbath with the Lord. It's taking his word and breathing it in to our life. And as it comes inside of us, it's gonna change the way that we act. It's gonna change the way that we live because our minds are gonna be set on things above and not on things of this world. Like how do we have the proper perspective of rest? How do we have the proper perspective of work? It's finding it in him. We breathe it in. Secondly, we begin to pray. And as we pray, it's us sharing our heart with the Lord. Jeremiah 33, three says this, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Like understanding that as I pray, it gives me an opportunity to share with the Lord what is going on in my heart and what's going on in my mind. Like he wants to hear from his children, just like you like to hear from your children. God the Father wants to hear from you. He wants to hear what's happening in your life. You see, we find rest in, in his word. We find rest in prayer. And for some of us, we also, we find rest in some of the pleasures of life and activities of life that we actually enjoy. Like for me, I, I enjoy windshield time. I enjoy getting away from traffic and getting out in a car and driving faster than I probably should and enjoying that time together. Like that's a beautiful way for me like to find rest. When I'm out at a, a sporting clays course with a shotgun in my hands and a couple of friends, like I find rest in that. That's enjoyment for me, like it recharges my batteries. Also for me, spending time with joy, that's my wife, brings me joy, that's so cheesy. Like more time with joy for me brings me more joy. Like it recharges me when I am with my wife. Like that is a time for me that I feel like I'm coming to life because I know that she loves me. She's not gonna judge me that much about what I eat. <laughs> like she is life giving to me. She's a gift that God has given to me. And you know, I think about this week in particular, like this is Thanksgiving week. In just a few short days, chances are you're gonna be sitting around a table with people that you know and with people that you love and you care about. And I wanna challenge you today just a little bit. You know, Thanksgiving is an awesome time to sit around and just talk about what God has done and to be thankful 
for all that he has blessed us with. But for many of us, this can be a tough time. We get around certain family members. Maybe you're that family member. And tension just starts to rise. And we live in a world today where we're, we're more digitally connected than ever before, but more relationally bankrupt than we've ever been, I'm afraid. Those stinking phones, man, it's so easy to get on something digital and just lose your mind for a time in another world. It's just like that death scroll of watching different reels and memes and seeing different things and sending them to your family and send them to your spouse or your kids or whoever, and you're just death scrolling and your mind is just in another place completely. Thanksgiving should be a time that we disconnect from digital and we reconnect with our family and our friends. Like dads, this can be hard for us. Moms, this can be difficult at times. Kids, your parents want to spend time with you. Our son's coming home this weekend. and When they don't live in the same state, boy, it changes the perspective you have on holidays really, really quick. Joanna, you know we were talking about last night, like I, I just don't wanna be on our phones a bunch. I wanna be with him. I wanna hang out with him. Our daughter's gonna be at work all day long, saving lives, doing something in the hospital. That's great. And we'll spend time with him. And I wanna encourage you to ask the questions. Go there. Be inquisitive about what's going on in your family's life. Ask the questions. Build and deepen the relationships. You'll be so grateful that you did because you don't know how long you have to do that. You see, you have to ask that question like, how do I steward my relationship with work and my relationship with rest? Today, if I'm being really honest, like this has been a struggle for me. At the age of 12, my dad's dad, my grandpa left. From the age of 12 and on, my dad, he purchased everything that he has in his life. His clothes, food, everything. His dad was gone. His mom didn't have a good paying job. And, so he had to start working at age 12 to help supply for the family for his younger brother and sister. My dad got married at a very young age, went to the military, and after getting in the military, got out, went to go work at Martin Tractor, work on big cats, and then he got his dream job working at Goodyear Tire and Rubber, the local 307. That's pretty exciting, people. And for 40 years, my dad worked at Goodyear. My dad didn't work five days a week. My dad didn't work six days a week. My dad worked seven days a week because the one thing he knew how to do was to work. We took three vacations in my life. I'm not asking for sympathy, but I can tell you that as a child, that affected me. And I was back in Kansas a couple of weeks ago helping him do a project. My dad's 81 years old and uh, we were just talking about this and I said, hey, I'm gonna be speaking on work and rest. Would it be okay if I shared part of our family's story? He said, you gonna tell them all how wrong I was? I said, absolutely, Dad, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and we had the conversation again. Dad, I know why you did that. You wanted to give us a life that you didn't have, and it's what you knew how to do. He said, that's exactly right, son, that's exactly why I did it. My dad's 81, he still works. Does he need to work? No. The dude is the hardest working man I have ever met in my life. He can fix anything. He's 81. Uh, we went for a ride in his car while we were there. Picture of my dad and I. It's my parents' front yard, and uh, I'm really happy because I'm driving and he's not, and so that's kind of how that works. I said, Dad, when it's 62 degrees, you take the 62 Corvette out. That's what you do in Kansas. And uh, we went for a ride for like an hour and a half. Those are the good old days, friends, that one day we'll talk about because the relationship I have with that man today is different than it's ever been because both of us have grown and worked really hard in that relationship. He reaches out more than he ever has before because he realized I worked too much. There are some of you in this room, your kids desperately want a relationship with you. I'm not upset, I'm not bitter, I'm grateful we've gotten to this point because I know not everybody does. Some of us have dad issues. And it comes, it comes because of this whole day of work and rest and how do those two things, how do they work together? Like, how do I do that the way that God would have me to? Here's my question for all of us today. 
Where are you at in your relationship with work and rest? For some of you, you need to breathe out, you need to start working harder. For some, you need to tone it back just a little bit and you invest in the people that God has put right in front of you. It's so easy to miss the forest for the trees on this one, isn't it? You see, why is this so important to talk about in Truth Wars? Because we believe that work is how I actually produce and that's who I am. Friends, that is not who you are, that's what you do. Who you are is a child of the one true king who desperately wants a relationship with you and desperately wants you to find your rest in him. Where are you at today when it comes to the idea of work and rest? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for what you've done. And we thank you for this whole idea of working and resting. Father, help us to find our rest and our identity in you and not what we do. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.